a bloodbath tonight in the rural town of Shinnom. Everyone here is hiding a secret. Four more victims found scattered. Some worse than others. I came as fast as I could. I'm Deputy Ruth Vogel. And soon, my quiet life will never be the same. Realm presents a 30 Ninjas production. Chinook. Starring Kelly Marie Tran and Sanaa Lathan. Listen to Chinook wherever you get your podcasts. Ah, the web tour. Those that both creators and were created by the threads disentangle from the fringes to feast on the very thing that spawned them. What's that, Jimmy? This is how you deal with me! Oh, no! <laughs> not have my children! Oh, you lost a feather. Can I keep it? No, you can't force me to. Do you know what lies within nothing? Rocket is in trouble, Akasa. Can, can we turn on the windshield remotely? No, she could lose her job as Nakasar. I don't fear Vehar. No, but you fear me. If you intend to trick me, I will not hesitate to sever the oath bond entirely. Why didn't you help me? Coward! I don't have a parachute! I don't like free falling! Counterbalance, a high fantasy audio drama. Season 2, coming 15th of October 2023. Learn more on trilunas.com. Hello and welcome to Vulgar History Season 3. This is a feminist women's history comedy podcast and my name is Anne Foster. This season's theme is How to Lose a Queen in Nine Days, aka the Lady Jane Grey scenario. So we're already up to episode 8 and we've we've talked about the ancestors of Lady Jane Grey, some of the influences on Lady Jane Grey, and now we're looking at sort of like a post-Jane Grey situation. What happened after she was queen for nine days and then was executed? You know, let's just backtrack. If you're listening to this episode, I'm gonna hope and assume you've probably listened to the other ones so far this season, so I don't want to get into the nitty-gritty family tree of it all, but just so that we're all up to speed. There was a king in England who was called Henry the Seventh. he married Elizabeth of York. They had several children. One of their children was Henry the Eighth. One of their other children, Henry the Eighth's younger sister, was Mary Tudor. Mary Tudor had a daughter named, well, she had two daughters, actually, but her older daughter, Frances Brandon, had three daughters. They were the Grey sisters, Jane, Catherine, and Mary. And because... It was sort of unclear who was going to inherit after Henry VIII's son, Edward, died very young. The Grey sisters were an option. So Jane herself was sort of thrust into the role of queen. That did not go well. She was executed aged 16. Last time we looked at the middle Grey sister, Catherine, who ran off and got secretly married and then got in trouble for that and ended up dying imprisoned. She did have two sons. And actually, just as a clarification from last time, I have since, through listening to an audiobook while I was researching, I learned that so Catherine's older son, Edward Seymour, I pronounced his title Lord Beauchamp, because that's how it's pronounced if you're a French person. It's B-E-A-U-C-H-A-M-P. Beauchamp, I would think. But in fact, because British people gotta be British, it's pronounced Beecham. So... That's going to come up, and that's the word I'm saying. I also learned through listening to audiobooks this past week that a man whose name I said an awful lot of times last episode, uh, William Cecil, is what I said several times. I was Queen Elizabeth the First's sort of fixer. Anyway, apparently it's William Cecil. So, a couple corrections there. I also neglected to include some more information about Catherine Gray's dogs. So I'm going to just slide that into this episode because there's some overlap here. Who we're looking at this week is the third Gray sister, Lady Mary Gray. And now I have to just put out my own personal bias, which is not to get too much into my personal life, but I'm the youngest of three sisters. And so I inherently really love the youngest 
of three sisters in any in stories in movies you know just the even if it's the youngest of five sisters i just like feel an affinity for the youngest so i i love right away i'm diving into this just with some some pre predisposed to to cheer on lady mary great but i'm cheering on all of them i'm cheering on everybody that's kind of what this podcast is about just looking at these women who deserve to be talked about and examined and explored and lady mary great of all the gray sisters all three of them i mean lady jane is the best known even if you didn't know until you listened to that episode slash this season why she was the 90s queen like her name is kind of known to history fans lady catherine gray people might know about because of the the secret marriage stuff maybe but lady mary gray is much less talked about which is interesting because i have a website where i post essays about women in history and my essay about lady mary gray which i published less than a year ago but it's consistently the top red thing so like people are curious about lady mary gray people want to know about lady mary gray and i'm here to explain who she was and what she did so let's get into it lady mary gray was born around 1545 so she was eight years younger than lady jane gray and five years younger than lady mary gray so she was those are the sorts of age gaps like five and eight years apart where once you become adults it's kind of like oh you're all pretty close in age but when you're kids that's huge like it's the difference between an infant and an eight-year-old and just because Jane was the oldest, she was given lots more opportunities. She was sent to royal court. So Mary wouldn't have known her super well just because of the age gap, effectively. There's not a lot of anything we know about Mary Grey to the extent to which we know about Lady Jane and Catherine. Because Lady Jane Grey and Catherine Grey, a lot of their letters and diaries and stuff, or not a lot of, but some of those exist. So we're able to learn more about them. Lady Mary Grey, there's a lot more of things like that left behind. But we can figure a lot of stuff out. And the person who figured out a lot of stuff for me to be able to tell you this in a podcast is historian Leander Delisle, who I've used her book a ton for many episodes in this series. So, and I cannot recommend it enough. Her book is called The Sisters Who Would Be Queen, Mary, Catherine, and Lady Jane Grey, A Tudor Tragedy. And I, you know, it's a good title, certainly a good title. I don't know if she chose the title. But I don't like calling someone's life a tragedy. I would not call her life a tragedy. So, Lady Mary Grey. Her parents were, as we discussed, Lady Frances Brandon, the daughter of Charles Brandon and Mary Tudor, and her father was Henry Grey, the first Duke of Suffolk. People in 16th century England were, on average, shorter than people in 21st century most western countries because of nutrition reasons and i think mostly nutrition reasons frankly so on average people were shorter than than they are now this is like if you go to visit any of the old castles or where i'm in canada there's some old forts and things you can visit and it's just stunning how like the stairs are really close together and the ceilings are kind of low and the beds are kind of short and it's just because the average person was shorter at that time so we know that lady jane gray herself was a short person that's how she's been described i believe catherine gray was as well but the thing with mary gray is she was especially short there's a couple portraits of her but you can't really tell from a portrait what someone looks like especially because her portraits are like from the waist up but she was notably short so she might have been a person with dwarfism Whether that is the sort of, I think it's pronounced achondroplasia, the like Sinead Burke or Peter Dinklage, or if she was some other sort of, for some other reason, genetically, just a very small person, but it was notable. It was notable. She was much smaller than the average person and people then were generally pretty small. So she would have been, had to have been really short in order for it to be that significant to people she may have also have had scoliosis which might have given her a crooked or a hunched back but i mean people were just kind of describing what they thought she looked like and these were not these were not her physicians these are not people who 
knew the names of diseases. They were just kind of like, she looks different from other people. And so they just kind of used the terminology they had at that time. But the thing is that this was a culture and an era and a time and a place where religion and superstition were closely entwined. It was a common belief in this place and time that if you were a sinner, it would be visible somehow on your body. The social order reflected the divine order in which what was good was also beautiful and ugliness and deformity was associated with sin and that which was base. So she would have been seen as somebody who people just because of the superstitions of the time, which frankly are not that different from cultural beliefs right now, where people just assume that people who are conventionally attractive are also necessarily better or more good of people. Anyway, so she would have been dealing with that sort of thing, but as the third sister, she could sort of live in the shadow of her more noticeable older older siblings, and also this sort of helped her when she needed to, to help her sort of hide herself and keep herself out of the line of fire. Sort of like if you've watched I, Claudius, slash read the book I, Claudius, slash are familiar with the ancient Roman emperor Claudius. He had a stammer and some physical differences as well, which made people assume that he was less intelligent, but he uses that to his advantage. People underestimate him and so then he's able to get one past them and he ends up being not murdered for a long time because people assume that he's less intelligent so i think this sort of becomes mary gray's superpower the fact that she looks physically different in a way that made people not worry about her so she could kind of go low under the radar that being said she was treated apparently just the same as her other sisters in terms of their education they were raised in a very luxurious, wealthy household, although her parents were often in debt because they threw so many expensive parties and were not good with financial management. But the three girls were raised to the highest educational standards of their time, so they had lessons in the humanities as well as instructions on how to run a household. They were also raised according to the still pretty new Protestant faith. So Marygrave was born at the same time that Henry VIII was married to his sixth wife, Catherine Parr. And then two years later, when Mary was two years old, Henry VIII died, and his nine-year-old son, who is also Mary Gray's cousin, once removed, Edward VI became the new king. So three years later, Mary Gray is five years old. Her older sister Jane, who is eight years older, went to stay with Catherine Parr and Thomas Seymour. So Catherine Parr, we talked about her, there's a whole episode about this, but Catherine Parr was married to Henry VIII. Henry they died, Catherine Parr got married to Thomas Seymour, who was a horrible, gross person. But at this point, no one really knew that. And so Jane left to go live with them for various reasons. So this is sort of like, as a much younger sister, it's like your older teenage sister goes off to university. Like Jane Grey had been coming and going to royal court off and on for all of Mary's life, probably, as an important person jane would be called upon to go there but this was a more permanent seeming sort of separation where she kind of like going off to university like we're just kind of recapping stuff we've talked about in other episodes but this is where we're focusing on mary and how this might have affected her so what happened is that for religious slash scheming reasons king edward the sixth changed his will to exclude his sisters, Mary and Elizabeth, and instead named as his successor, Lady Jane Grey, who is Mary Grey's oldest sister. And then presumably after her would be like the children of Lady Jane Grey, and then would be Catherine, and then would be Mary Grey. So this kind of elevated the three Grey sisters suddenly and kind of unexpectedly. And looking back on all of this and the succession crisis and who would be the queen. Elizabeth I is such a famous and well-known queen and kind of part of that is there's a lot of propaganda after her life or after her death to kind of elevate her as this like Gloriana and stuff. Well, some of that happened during her life as well. But basically at this point, no one knew that she was going to be a good queen who would reign for decades and decades and do a good job of queening like anything was possible. It was all very precarious and anyone could have taken over. So that's kind of what 
we're dealing with here. We know how the story ends, but I'm just trying to put myself in the shoes of someone who doesn't, who doesn't know what's going to happen here. So when Mary Gray was about seven years old, she got so ill that apparently she nearly died, but she recovered from whatever oldie time thing happened to her. And when she was eight years old, she was betrothed to her distant cousin, Arthur Gray, and her sisters, Jane and Catherine, were married off to various other people. Arthur Gray, her the, the betrothed to this eight-year-old girl, was middle-aged, and his face had been disfigured when a Scottish pike was thrust through the roof of his mouth. So he had some interesting scars on his head. He was also renowned as a very good soldier. But, I mean, she was eight, and this is all kind of weird. The reason that the Gray sisters were married off like this all at once, or slash betrothed, Mary was not actually married because she was just eight years old, was because of the changing of the will. And so it seemed like if they were going to become more important, they wanted to make some good connections between them and other families by marrying them to strategically to other families. So briefly, just after the sisters were betrothed slash married, in the following 12 months, Edward VI died of tuberculosis. Jane Grey became queen for nine days and then was imprisoned. Queen Mary I took power. She made England be Catholic again. Mary Grey's father got involved in a rebellion against Mary. And then Jane Grey and their father were both executed. As punishment for, mostly for their father's actions, the surviving Grey family, which was Francis, the mother, Mary and Catherine, they were stripped of their property and wealth, and also Mary Gray's betrothal was dissolved because no one wanted to marry these toxic people anymore. To stay safe, Frances, her mother, she stuck close with Mary and Catherine, and they all kind of acted like they were Catholic now, and that was totally fine. No big deal. Please don't execute us. And also, shortly after, to protect them all, Frances took a new husband who is named Adrian Stokes, and he was a commoner. And effectively, by marrying someone so low-born, he wasn't like a random person off the street, but he wasn't a royal or a noble. It nullified Frances's claim, any claim she had to the throne, and it meant any more children she had wouldn't be at risk of being executed. So it sort of saved slash protected them. Also, this is a sort of place culturally where having a husband was just... It was helpful for women in general to have a man. Anyway, Adrian Stokes seems like a good guy. And straight away, Frances left royal court because she had married this lower class man. And Mary Gray, who was 10 years old, left court with them. And there's not a lot written about Mary for the next little while. But presumably she was off with Adrian Stokes and Frances and seeing them having this nice relationship and they all would be presumably getting over this psychological trauma of having Jane and the father executed. There's a lot to get over and so they had some time away. Good for them. Three years later, so Mary is now 13. Queen Mary I died and Elizabeth took over. One year after that, Frances, Mary's mother, passed away. Mary and Catherine were at her side as she died. Frances left most of her estate. So I, Frances had worked really hard to get some of their money and stuff back after the disgrace of the family. And so what she had, Frances left most of it to Adrian Stokes with a small inheritance each for Catherine and for Mary. So Elizabeth I is the queen. And again, like, it's so hard to disengage myself from thinking about like, and she was a queen for decades and Gloriana and painting her face white and everything. But at this point, she could have easily been usurped and there were lots of people who wanted to. And we know now her gambit of not getting married and not having children paid off really well because she was able to not die in childbirth and not have any man control her and she became like married to the country and whatever. But at this time, everyone's like, Ugh, is she really... Do we want to have a queen who's not married and has no children? And as long as she didn't have any children, the question was, well, who is going to be her heir? And so there had been such a turnover of monarchs over the last, like, what, five years 
when there's not a smooth transition from one monarch to another, just so many little factions build up and there's instability and sort of chaos in the kingdom. And that's what everybody wanted to avoid. So the question of like, who will be Elizabeth's heir was a pretty major question. Officially, her heir was Catherine Gray, followed by Mary Gray. As such, both girls took on positions as lady-in-waiting to Queen Elizabeth, their cousin once removed, which luckily for them brought along with it some a salary. So they were, they went from being very poor to having more money so they could get like nice outfits and stuff. Later on, Mary Gray buys some incredible outfits. So she, I'm sure, was really excited about this. And just for the record, as close relatives to the queen slash potential heirs, neither Catherine nor Mary Gray was allowed to marry without Elizabeth's permission. So just tuck that factoid away. Maybe that's going to come up. Actually, it's going to come up right away. So 1560, Mary Gray is 15 years old. Catherine Gray is 20. And Catherine Gray secretly married Edward, a.k.a. Ned Seymour. You can listen to the previous episode of this podcast for how that turned out for everybody. Elizabeth found out about the secret marriage. She had the... The marriage declared invalid, but Catherine had a son, Edward, Lord Beecham, who was declared illegitimate. This just took, it all took a long time to sort out, during which time Catherine, who was in jail, and so was Ned, they ended up conceiving another son, who was also named illegitimate, I think, and he was named Thomas, and so just kind of chaos. And Mary Gray was just doing her I, Claudius thing, just kind of staying out of trouble, staying, being well-behaved, and trying to not be executed for the wild actions of her relatives the thing is that even though so Catherine gray was sent to prison for having gotten secretly married and have having sons but as long as Catherine was alive and elizabeth didn't have any children Catherine, even in prison was a potential heir to the throne as were her two sons interestingly lady mary gray doesn't seem to have ever been seen really as a rival or a possibility there were like the people who thought that someone from this of the family tree should take over but all their support behind Catherine and especially because she had a husband and she had these sons it was easy to contrast her with Elizabeth who was not married and didn't have any children Mary didn't really have that power behind her part of this presumably is Catherine was older and so she was next in line technically but also I think part of this might have been because the cultural belief at the time not just that like People who were good looked beautiful and con- or like looked conventionally attractive. But also there's the idea that the monarch needed to look the part. Like the monarch, the king or queen, ostensibly had been chosen by God. And so God would choose the best person. And so that person would be based on, if you follow the thinking, would be kind of the most conventionally attractive person at the time. And I wonder if that's part of why Elizabeth was so obsessed with always wanting to be the prettiest person around. Anyway, so Mary had obvious, visible, physical differences that might have made people just not want to rally behind her cause. Meanwhile, um, we're going to get to Mary, Queen of Scots, I think, a bit in here, who was another major rival to Elizabeth. She was the descendant of King Henry VIII's other sister, Margaret, and her kind of shenanigans really kept Elizabeth distracted from what the Grey sisters were up to. And Mary, Queen of Scots, was also, I think, like six feet tall. So there's just a lot of interesting heights of people in this, considering if you just imagine everybody was about five feet tall, Mary Grey, way shorter, Mary, Queen of Scots, way taller. Just interesting that the main characters in this story are all kind of outliers size-wise. Anyway... So much of what we know about what happened in this era was from letters from various Spanish ambassadors because they were all catty bitches who just like sending all the gossip back to Spain. So whichever Spanish ambassador was around at this time described Mary Gray as crook-backed and very ugly, which, fuck you, like what did you look like? I don't know. So Mary Gray, because of her physical differences, made her less of a threat. And then also being the younger sister, she potentially would have hoped that she could have a bit more freedom than what Jane and Catherine had had. We know that Mary admired her older sisters. Throughout her whole life, she kept with her a copy of a book called The Book of Martyrs, 
which contained a description of Lady Jane Grey's brave death. So she wouldn't have known her sister Jane very much because Jane left when Mary was, what, like five years old and then became queen and then was executed. But she clearly admired her and the way that she had comported herself. She also, I'm going to guess, likely appreciated the love story of her sister Catherine um, and Catherine's bravery to get secretly married against the queen's wishes. She probably, and again, we don't know a lot about her, so I'm just doing a lot of supposition here, but probably Mary Grey also saw how her mother's marriage to Adrian Stokes had protected her from all the courtly scheming and how marrying a lower-born man was actually kind of a clever thing to do. This is what we know, this is what I'm guessing about what was going on inside of her head, because we don't know what she did until 1565, Mary Gray is 20 years old, and she fell in love with a man named Thomas Keyes. Who was Thomas Keyes? He was a widower, twice Mary's age, so she was 20, I guess he was at least 40, and he had several children from his first marriage, like six or seven. He worked at the palace, and his job was called the Sergeant Porter, which was sort of like head of security slash bouncer sort of situation. So his job required that he was seen as being super trustworthy, entirely loyal to the queen, also really physically imposing. So he was a soldier and he would like his tasks would include things like if the if the courtiers got drunk and unruly or got into fights or someone tried to sneak in like he would he would intervene. So he was also because height is just like no one has the same height in the story as each other. He was apparently six foot eight. Again, if like the average, like if most people are five feet tall, he's six foot eight, which is extremely tall for nowadays when there's, you know, calcium and milk and fluoride in the water. So he was a massive person. At first I read six foot eight and I was picturing sort of like a lanky basketball player type person, but now I'm picturing... In order to be physically imposing to do the sorts of stuff he was doing, I think he must have been also broad. So like really tall, but also big. So now I'm picturing Andre the Giant. So two people, one much taller than average, one much smaller than average, and they fall in love. So uh, Thomas Keyes, like a bouncer, part of his job was he'd be stationed at the front gates to ensure peaceful comings and goings from the palace. And Mary, as a lady-in-waiting, would be coming and going from the palace pretty often, so they would see each other every time she would come and go. And he started to court her. So he would court her in the traditional sense of how people were supposed to do it then. So he would give her tokens like jewelry and other sorts of thoughtful things when she passed through the gates. Clearly, she fell for him as well. And they decided they wouldn't let their age difference, their height difference, or the fact that Mary's sister was literally in prison right now for marrying without consent get in their way. So Catherine Gray had been sent to jail for marrying without the queen's permission. That was partially also because Catherine Gray had married somebody who made her children be major threats to take over from Elizabeth. Mary was thinking of marrying somebody who would actually make take her out of contention for the throne. So maybe Elizabeth would like that, but they still had to get Elizabeth's permission. But the thing was, Elizabeth was kind of busy and they couldn't get, like the timing was just never right to ask her. For instance, at this particular time, Elizabeth was busy with Mary Queen of Scots, who was becoming more and more of a threat. For interest's sake, at this point, Elizabeth's plan was so Mary Queen of Scots was not married to anyone yet. Elizabeth wanted to marry Mary Queen of Scots to Elizabeth's boyfriend, Robert Dudley, because Robert Dudley was like the most loyal person to her she knew, and she wanted to make sure that Mary Queen of Scots was less of a threat. Mary Queen of Scots was like, I'm not going to marry your boyfriend. I'm going to actually marry my cousin, Lord Darnley, who is just like the worst person in history. And also, marrying Lord Darnley made Mary Queen of Scots even more of a threat for various reasons we won't get into because this is a Lady Mary Grey podcast, not a Mary Queen of Scots podcast. This is all just a lot of major things going on such that Elizabeth was too busy for Mary Grey to ask permission to get married. And then I guess they got impatient. And I feel like this is the Mary Grey of it all. These bo- All three sisters were just really stubborn and headstrong and wanted what they wanted. And I love that about them. Anyway, so they decided to elope. I can't imagine Thomas Keyes came up with that idea and convinced Mary. Like, I feel much more like Mary would have 
decided to do this, like partially because she sort of idolized her sister Catherine, but she was not marrying somebody who would make her more of a threat. So a lot of what went wrong with Catherine Gray's marriage, one part of everything that went really wrong was that there wasn't enough witnesses to it. So like, was it legitimate or not? So Mary Gray made sure there would be enough witnesses at her wedding. So here is what she did. Their scheme was to wait until Elizabeth was out of town. So Elizabeth was going to go to a wedding of a family member, along with most of the courtiers. So there'd just be a few people left behind. And then just for a suspense, for a second on the day that Elizabeth was supposed to leave, it seemed suddenly like, oh, maybe she was going to not. She's going to maybe miss the wedding because of various Spanish political reasons. But then after the suspense, Elizabeth and everybody wound up leaving. So it was on. July 16th, 1565. Mary Gray had dinner with three of her cousins, who were also her secret wedding guests. She had a childhood friend named Margaret Willoughby, who had grown up, she'd spent like, I think, at least a year growing up with the Gray sisters after her own parents had died. So they were really close, similar to how Catherine was BFFs with Lady Jane Seymour. Margaret Willoughby was Mary's cousin slash close friend and kind of like a sister to her with one of her sisters being dead and the other sister in jail. She was the closest she had to a sister that she could interact with at this point. So Margaret Willoughby is one of these secret guests, as well as two women who I've only seen described as the two daughters of Lady Stafford, who were apparently also her cousins. But she needed to have an official witness for the actual wedding ceremony. And it was really dangerous because this was a secret wedding. So if somebody really high ranking did it, they make it in super trouble. So Mary decided to get a servant girl to be the official witness. And so there was a servant girl named Frances Goldwell, who Mary liked. Frances Goldwell didn't know any of this was happening. She was just summoned and she didn't know why. And what she was summoned for was to be the one in the room when the wedding took place. So the ceremony was held in the council chamber which I'm not sure what that is, but it was a room that I hope was nice looking. There were no candles lit as it was still daytime. So the sun was lighting up the room. There were 11 guests along with a priest, but um, most of them stood outside. So they wouldn't be like if and when this all blew up, they wouldn't be in trouble for actually witnessing it. Just Francis Goldwell was there to witness it. After the ceremony, there was a party with banqueting meats and everyone partied and had a great time. And then the bride and groom got to go and consummate their marriage. And for 10 days, everything was great. And then Mary, Queen of Scots, married Lord Darnley, which was very scandalous and very devastating to Elizabeth. Mary, Queen of Scots was like, okay, me and my new husband, Darnley, the worst person in the world, We promise that we're not going to invade England as long as you pass an act of parliament saying that I, Mary Queen of Scots, am officially your heir. And Elizabeth knew that parliament would not agree to that because parliament actually was more of a fan of Catherine Grey being her heir. So she wasn't able to do that. And that probably made her frustrated, especially kind of frustrated about the Grey sisters in general. So it was sort of like a the worst possible time for her, for the rumors to finally reach her about the fact that Lady Mary Grey had gotten secret sexy married in an elopement 10 days ago. So as per William Cecil, who other than the Spanish ambassadors is another major source of gossip from this time. Here is an unhappy chance and monstrous. The Sergeant Porter, being the biggest gentleman of this court, has married secretly the Lady Mary Grey, the least of all the court, the offense is very great. So in order to avoid pregnancy, Elizabeth had Mary Gray and Thomas Keyes sent to separate prisons in different cities. So there was no chance of getting a secret jail pregnancy occurring. Meanwhile, Frances Goldwell, the little servant girl, got in trouble for being the witness to all of this. Her mistress was named Lady Howard, who, you know, brought her in and was like, what's Frances Goldwell like did you do this like treasonous thing but Frances Goldwell lied and pretended like she didn't understand what was going on or what was being asked of her she's like I don't was I didn't know that was a wedding I just thought it was people standing there saying things but Lady Howard had always thought that Frances Goldwell was kind of unintelligent and so this Frances Goldwell didn't get in too much trouble because Lady Howard was like "Mm, Frances you dummy like you didn't realize what you saw anyway Frances didn't get in trouble 
So sort of like the Mary Gray strategy of just like if you pretend like you're as unintelligent as people assume you are, then maybe you don't get in trouble. Except in this instance, Mary Gray had shown her intelligence by having this secret scheme, and then she did get in trouble. So Mary Gray was sent to, instead of like a prison prison, she sent to a country house to just sort of be kept in house arrest. So she sent to a house called Checkers, which is still around and used today as one of the residents of the British Prime Minister. She was kept, though, in a room that was 12, 12 foot. I don't know if that's like 12 foot by 12 foot. Let's imagine that. Anyway, a small room. She's a small person, but, you know, that's not pleasant. The room is now known as the prison room, and apparently if you go there now, you can still see some drawings and writing that apparently Mary herself left on the walls while she was in there, just, like, being bored. So, like, the person who lived in Checkers became her jailer, and his name was Sir William Hawtrey, and he was an old family friend, so he was probably going to be sympathetic for her, although he still had to obey all the rules that Elizabeth gave about what Mary could and could not do. Like, for instance, she was not allowed to see anybody, she was not allowed to write letters or to receive letters, and she could only go outside to walk just the bare minimum she needed for, like, health-related reasons. Much like when Catherine was put in prison, who at this point, like, parallel, now they're both in prison, Catherine and Mary. So Mary wrote to William Cecil to try and advocate for herself to get some improvements to her situation. And it does sound like he was doing his best to try and get Elizabeth to forgive Mary and marry herself. All the letters that she wrote, she signed Mary Gray to already sort of try and pretend like she hadn't been married to try and... So she's like, if we just all pretend like I'm not married, then I'm not in trouble anymore. I'm Mary Gray, not Mary Keys. Everything's fine. Meanwhile, things were really bad for Thomas Keys. So he was not a royal like the greys so it's not like you are too important and getting married was bad but the whole thing about his job as sergeant porter was it so much relied on him being trustworthy and loyal and dependable so to secretly marry one of the queen's relatives was seen as such a huge betrayal of his position he was sent to a notoriously awful literal prison called fleet and he was kept in solitary confinement in a small cell which was not big enough for him, Andre the giant-sized person. So he was in constant discomfort slash agony. Like, he couldn't stand, he couldn't stretch his legs out. He wasn't even allowed to go walking. Like, he was just smooshed up in this jail cell. He offered to agree to an annulment, but this is where Mary tried to correct for what had gone wrong with Catherine's marriage, but it's sort of like she went too far the other way. There was too many witnesses. They couldn't, there was no way they could annul the marriage. People had seen it happen. It had been consummated. Like there were no grounds to annul the marriage. And a year went by. And after one year, a new jailer came into fleet who was apparently extra sadistic. So Thomas Keyes, he'd been there for a year. He was like an industrious person, soldier, So he had been using handmade slingshots that he made himself to capture birds to eat. I guess he had a window and he was using a slingshot. So I mean, like, amazing. Like, good job, Thomas Keyes. But the new sadistic new jailer was like, no, you can't prepare your own meals, a.k.a. catch birds. So he was only given rotten meat to eat. On one occasion, the food he was given had first been dropped on the floor in the poison for the dogs before being given to him. So he was like actively trying to be murdered. Mary Gray was pretty frantic about this, frankly, but (laughs) nothing could be done. Like she wrote letters to William Cecil. Elizabeth was very firm that she would not give in whatsoever. So another year passed and eventually, so for political reasons, Elizabeth moved Mary Gray from Checkers to go and live with her step-grandmother, Catherine Willoughby from episode two of this podcast season. Catherine Willoughby still hanging out. So Catherine Willoughby, to recap, had spent some time, um, she fled to like mainland Europe when Protestants were being persecuted, but then she came back and was just being an overall super cool person. And she's Mary Gray's step-grandmother. So Catherine Willoughby was told like, guess who's coming to stay with you? Mary Gray. 
and then Mary Gray just like showed up one day, like early. So she, she was surprised that Mary arrived the day she did. And also Mary Gray arrived with almost no belongings. And Catherine was confused because she knew Mary Gray had been raised effectively like a princess in utmost luxury with the, the nicest of everything. And she's just like, Mary, where's, where's all your luggage? And Mary's like, I don't own anything. <laughs> like, I have been in prison. And the thing is that Catherine didn't have stuff to lend her, like even, you know, furniture, because she had spent this time in Europe and she had lost so much money and belongings because of being on the run. But she did what she could because she was a cool person. She did report, though, in letters that Mary Gray was nothing like she used to be, not the like spirited, opinionated, cool person that she had been as a younger pre-prison. Catherine Willoughby also reported that like Catherine Gray and like Elizabeth and Mary, um, Queen Mary, Mary Gray was so depressed that she refused to eat. So the whole like being so stressed you can't eat just seems to really happen a lot to women in the Tudor family. Anyway, so Mary is depressed, not eating. Obviously her husband is in this gruesome prison being fed dog poison. She has no money. Life is kind of shitty for her right now. But Catherine hoped that being hanging out there with her stepfamily would raise Mary's spirits and bring her kind of back to herself. So Catherine Willoughby is her step-grandmother, and Catherine Willoughby's two children were there with her peregrine and Susan Bertie, who were, I guess, technically Mary Gray's step-aunt and step-uncle, although Susan and Peregrine were both about 10 years younger than her. So at this point, Mary Gray is in her mid-20s, and Peregrine and Susan were in their mid-teens. And apparently they did get on very well. But again, to sort of like the ripple effects of what Mary, Queen of Scots, was up to, all this stuff was heating up. And again, I'm not going to get into it now. Just know there's a lot of story to tell. But remember, Mary, Queen of Scots married Darnley, the worst man in the world. So eventually she realized he was the worst man in the world. And then Darnley was murdered when his house blew up. And then Mary, Queen of Scots, quickly married the person who might have blown up the house, got pregnant with twins, was sent off to a prison island, uh, miscarried the twins, and then escaped from the prison island disguised as a washerwoman. Like, whenever I get to the Mary Queen of Scots on this podcast, I feel like that's going to be its own, like, 12-part series, because the woman's life was eventful. So at this point, Mary Queen of Scots was very clearly the main rival to Elizabeth, slash really wanted to be the heir but Mary Gray was still around and Elizabeth wanted to keep her out of the way and kind of wanted to keep her just doing as poorly as possible to keep her from having the strength or anything to, to fight back. So Mary Gray was removed from Catherine Willoughby's household and moved to another country house arrest situation. So her new host slash jailer was a man named Sir Thomas Gresham and his wife, Anne Gresham. So Thomas Gresham was a former mayor of London, and he had a huge house with gardens she could walk in, which is nice. I guess hopefully her room was bigger than 12 feet. And he was also, this is the issue of what house she was sent to, is whoever whoever Mary was staying with had to shoulder the financial burden of maintaining her because Elizabeth didn't want to slash couldn't pay for it. So Thomas Gresham was rich enough that he could afford it, which is part of why Mary was sent there. But things did not go well there because the Greshams were not doing well as a couple. So Sir Thomas Gresham was, he had chronic pain. So his leg had been broken at some point and it had been set badly. So he was in constant pain. It was described in one book as constant agony. He had also gone half blind. Thomas and Anne Gresham's son had recently-ish died. And Anne hated having Mary Gray there. She blamed Mary, Mary's presence for why Anne couldn't go and visit her mother, who was like 90 years old. I'm not sure what the connection there is. Anyway, Anne described Mary Gray as the heart and sorrow of my life. So her presence there made Thomas Gresham and his wife, who were already not getting along, not get along even more. So straight away, Thomas Gresham started writing to William Cecil to try and have Mary sent away. And that didn't happen for a while. But meanwhile, after four years of being smooshed in a too small jail cell in Fleet, Thomas Keyes was finally released and 
So he's released and he was allowed to go work. So he's given a job as a security officer sort of thing near his home in Kent, which meant that he got to reunite with his six or seven children from his first marriage. And he was just like a nice guy. And he was still he still considered Mary his wife, which Mary was his wife. And so he wrote very polite letters to Elizabeth and I guess maybe also William Cecil ask, saying like, you know, since I'm out of jail, like it'd be cool if I could live with my wife again, who is Mary Gray. But Elizabeth did not permit that. In the middle of all of this, I didn't even mention that Catherine Gray had died in prison. So she died in prison in 1568. And this kind of is part of why Mary Gray became kind of more of a concern to Elizabeth. That's why she went from living in like the nice situation to sort of a less nice situation. And the thing that I forgot to mention last time when I was talking about Catherine Gray is so Catherine Gray was sent to jail and it was again just like a house slash jail. Anyway, she's permitted to keep her spaniels and her monkeys with her. What I forgot to mention last time is apparently when Catherine Gray died, there's a sort of a legend, sort of a maybe true, maybe not story that her dog was so sad that she died that the dog was maybe at her funeral. And so the dog just like laid down on her grave. And then the dog, like Catherine had herself, just like stayed there and starved itself to death out of grief. Just some some dog sadness there. I felt like I should mention that to you. And I forgot to say it in the last episode. Anyway, so Catherine Gray had died, meaning Mary Gray was the last remaining sort of challenger because Catherine Gray's two sons were technically illegitimate. So things are going okay. Thomas Keyes is back out of prison. He can like walk around and stretch his long arms and legs. He gets to hang out with his six or seven children. But things are not great because he had contracted so many health issues from his time in fleet, just from everything being in an uncomfortable situation for so long and for being fed dog poison and rotten meat and everything that happened. So his health issues compounded to the point that he died. He'd been out of jail for two years when he died. So they knew they, like the jailers, knew that they were going to have to break this news to Mary Gray. They knew she'd be really upset. So they waited a few days to tell her until a doctor could be sent to the Gresham house because they knew that she'd be so upset and maybe she'd faint or something and they wanted a doctor to be on hand. And in fact... She was really upset, so maybe it's good the doctor was there. She asked Gresham to write to Elizabeth for permission for Mary to dress in mourning clothes to recognize the fact that her husband had just died. She also wanted to take custody over Thomas's now orphaned children, but Elizabeth did not permit either because Elizabeth was sort of forcing Mary to pretend like she had never been married. And this is where Mary is kind of true, obstinate, gray sister personality really shines because these are some letters that exist so we can really see what she was like so mary's first letters that she wrote to elizabeth were being like oh i'm so sorry that i offended you sincerely mary gray but after thomas died for the first time mary signed her letters mary keys so she was just like guess what like you're not like you wouldn't let me in all this marriage you sent my husband to this awful jail for so long and like fuck you basically but in like polite oldie time ways at this point, the letters she wrote to Elizabeth were like, well, since, you know, literally my husband is dead, I guess you have no reason to be mad at me. So can you just let me out of jail? Thanks. Fuck you. Mary Gray. But again, with no swears. At around the same time, a portrait was painted of her. So I don't know if she had it commissioned or something, but I feel like this was part of her just sort of like rage grief process. So this is a portrait you can still see. If you look at the Instagram for this podcast, you can see it there. Anyway, so in the portrait her wedding ring is front and center. So it's very much just like a fuck you, Elizabeth, of a portrait. So Mary Gray, her spirit now entirely back, her super strong old personality, very clear, made Gresham even more desperate to get rid of her because she was even more of an imposition to him and his terrible marriage. He got kind of unhinged. Like he sent more and more letters begging to have Mary Gray sent away, like to the point that he was sending like two letters a day, which is considering how long it took for letters to be delivered. Like that's like sending 200 text messages in an hour. Finally, May 1572, Mary Gray had been in house arrest for seven years and Elizabeth finally allowed her to be freed. What had changed? As per everything affecting Mary Gray in the story, it had to do with Mary, Queen of Scots. 
So at this point, people wanted Elizabeth to be nicer to Mary, Queen of Scots, which she didn't want to do. But she was like, well, what if I'm nice to Mary Gray instead? Like, I can be nice to someone called Mary. It'll, I'll just be nice to Mary Gray. So at this point, Mary Gray was totally not a threat. Like, there's not supporters who, like, wanted her to be the queen instead of Elizabeth. The people who supported the Gray sort of branch of things were supporting, I think, Catherine's sons at this point. And some other people who will look at in next week's finale episode. Anyway, for whatever reason, Mary Gray was finally freed from house arrest so she could go off and be a glamorous person. But the thing is her inheritance had not been restored to her and she had no money to set up her own household. She pleaded with Elizabeth and finally Elizabeth gave in and permitted her to have a small allowance. So Mary left the Greshams like as soon as she was able to. And apparently Thomas Gresham wrote a letter saying that Mary left with all her books and rubbish. And I think everyone was just really glad that they didn't have to be roommates anymore. And Mary did have a lot of books. She spent a lot of her time reading books about um, theology and religion. And I don't know if she was like really into books before she was in prison for seven years, but I think the books were really what helped her pass the time and make it through and find her strength. So... She had no money, but she was free, and she had nowhere else to really go, so at first she went to live with her stepfather, Adrian Stokes, who, remember, was the commoner who her mother, Frances, had married. Frances had died several years before, and Adrian Stokes had remarried, because, like, nobody in Tudor times was staying single, ever. So Adrian Stokes had a new wife, who was the former Lady Throckmorton, who had seven children from her previous marriage. So these were kind of Mary's step, step siblings. This is getting into sort of a complicated, like Kardashian Jenner level step, step situation. Anyway, the seven Throckmorton children. The thing is that one of them was a nine-year-old girl named Bess Throckmorton, who years later would get in trouble with Elizabeth for having her own secret sexy marriage. And I'm sure we'll talk about that on some other podcast at some point, but Bess Throckmorton, or as I think of her, Throcko, she was pretty much a legend as well, which is pretty cool. So just a little cameo appearance by little baby Throcko here. So Lady Throckmorton had known Mary Gray since she was a girl and was very kind and lavished attention on her, which is just what Mary needed, I think, at this point, just like some motherly attention and love and someone to be nice to her and not hate her like the Greshams had. And also the house that they were now living in was one of the ones that Mary had grown up in. And her room was sort of left behind. You know, like when someone goes off to college and you come back for Christmas, it's like, oh, your room is still just the same. But she was also like, "Mm, I'm also 27 years old and I would like to not live in my childhood home and be a fabulous independent woman. And less than a year later, she had saved up enough money from, I guess, from her allowance or I don't even know just from her own cleverness, she had enough money on hand that she's able to start her own household. And thus begins a new phase of Lady Mary Gray's life, gal about town. So she was a social butterfly. She had lots of really close friendships, including with her step-grandmother, Catherine Willoughby, as well as her step-aunt and uncle who were teenagers, Susan and Peregrine Bertie, She was still tight with Margaret Willoughby, her wedding guest and childhood friend. And although she hadn't been given permission by Elizabeth to take custody of Thomas Keyes' children, she caught up with them and became sort of a, a friend to them, especially his daughter, Jane Merrick, who was close enough to Mary Gray that she made Mary Gray the godmother to her daughter, who was named Mary, probably after her. Mary Gray also stayed in touch with her sister Catherine's widower, Ned Seymour, who kept her up to date on what the latest news was with Edward and Thomas, her little nephews. She also carefully maintained relationships with some of her old friends from her lady-in-waiting courtier days, such as a woman named Blanche Perry, who was a gentlewoman of the privy chamber, so one of the people who was closest to Elizabeth. It was probably Blanche who facilitated the delivery of a New Year's gift in 1574, uh, when Mary Gray sent Queen Elizabeth a pair of bracelets, and the Queen accepted the gift, which is like sort of a hint that maybe she wasn't so mad at Mary anymore. The following year, 1575, Elizabeth agreed to give Mary Gray some of the income from her family property. So after the Grays had all been sent to prison, 
all of the income from the property just went to the crown. Like it had been going to Elizabeth and now she decided Mary Gray can have some of that income. So she's like coming around vis-a-vis Mary Gray at this point, which I think speaks to Mary having some of the same powers of persuasion and charm that her mother, Frances Brandon, had had of being able to, even after having done treasonous things, it's like, well, you can't stay mad. Like, look how nice she is. So again, just her cleverness, I appreciate. Anyway, so Mary had enough money for her household, and now with the income from the family properties, she now had enough money not just to survive, but to thrive. And she went out and bought gorgeous new bespoke dresses and jewels. Um, One of them is like yellow and black, so she's sort of like a fashionable bee. Like, she had been raised in luxury and then had all taken away, and then she was just like finally had her own money, her own income, and she was just like living it up. Good for her. And now that she was not, like, she had enough money that she could actually have interests and not just be desperate all the time. So she kept up with her reading. She was really interested in reading books about the Protestant versus Catholic situation, although she stayed personally entirely out of politics, not wanting to make waves or get in trouble about anything. She just, like, you know, read, read up, like, reading the news, but, you know, keeping herself out of it for personal reasons. And all of this was just the right approach because by the end of 1577, Elizabeth appointed Lady Mary Grey to be a maid of honor to the queen. So her rehabilitation was complete. She had gone from being a lady-in-waiting to being in prison to being bankrupt to being a lady about town, and now she was restored. Amazing. But then, plague. So... Lady Mary Grey became a maid of honor to the queen at the end of 1577, and then that following April, plague hit London very hard. All the rich people, like, people didn't know about germ theory, but they just kind of knew about kind of like, if someone had the plague, just like, don't get too close to them, probably. So all the rich people kind of like ran away to their, the equivalent of like the Hamptons or whatever, to stay away from all the people with the plague including Mary. So she was at her home in the country and she fell ill despite being there, which is where it's like, did she fall ill with a plague or was it something else? And we do not know. But this is where I just truly need to bring up the fact that she may have thought she was protected from the plague because she owned a mystic ruby. Her sister, Lady Jane Grey, also had owned a mystic ruby. What is a mystic ruby? Well, to quote Leanda Delisle, this magical treasure was said to be created by crystallization of the blood in very old, wise unicorns and was found at the base of their horns, forming a distillation of their very essence. According to the medieval alchemist Albertus Magnus, mystic rubies would guard against plague. Anyway, Mary Grey got really sick, despite having a mystic ruby. She knew how sick she was, she knew she was dying, and so she drew up her will. She identified herself in the will as Lady Mary Grey, comma, widow. So sort of balancing things. Like, when she went back to be a lady in waiting for Elizabeth, she had to pretend like she'd never been married and not use the last name Keys. But at least she called herself a widow to just... It just shows that she was still devoted to him, and she's still angry at the whole situation, and also proud to be the widow of Thomas Keys. So in her will, she bequeathed some of her items to Catherine Willoughby, also some things to Susan Brittany, things to her friend Margaret Willoughby, some stuff to Lady Throckmorton, some to her stepdaughter Jane Merrick. She left things to two of her male servants and the bulk of her fortune to her goddaughter, so Thomas Keyes' granddaughter, Mary Merrick. She also left some funds to a servant boy so that he could be trained in a trade. So just really thinking of who was left behind and what should we leave them. And I believe she left the mystic ruby to Catherine Willoughby. And now it's like a dream of mine to, in auction, purchase a mystic ruby, whether Lady Mary Grey's or someone else. I just feel like that's a goal of mine now. Anyway, so Lady Mary Grey died on April 20th, 1578, aged 33. In her will, she very savvily had said, like, the queen can decide where she should be buried. Like, she wasn't going to make any demands. And as she was a lady-in-waiting, and the queen liked her at this point, her funeral, and she was the queen's relative, like she was a descendant of Henry VII, so Lady Mary Grey's funeral was marked with a procession, and her coffin, which was described as being tiny, was delivered to Westminster Abbey, where so many of her royal ancestors had been buried before. Elizabeth arranged to have Mary Grey's remains laid to rest in the same tomb as her mother, Frances, 
The chief mourner at the funeral was Mary's step aunt, slash 10 years younger than her, Susan Bertie. Mary's grave is still unmarked, but if you go to see where Francis Brandon is buried, Mary's remains are there as well. But now it's time to score Lady Mary Grey on our scandalicious scale. Just to recap where everybody else fell thus far this season, they're all pretty close together. They're sort of like little clusters. So the top scorer so far this season is Lady Jane Grey with 29.5. Lady Catherine Grey has a 29. So the Grey sisters are already up top. Will Lady Mary Grey be up there with her sisters? We will see. The first category is scandaliciousness. So this is the juiciness of any scandals in which she was involved. And frankly, a secret sexy marriage is one of the most scandalous things you can do. It's scandalous that she fell in love with the bouncer, the like castle bouncer, and they courted as she walked by in and out of the gates. And then the fact that they waited for Elizabeth to go out of town and had a secret marriage that was like very cleverly well prepared where she had she knew everybody would be away except for her guests and then she got the certain I guess that's more scheminess. Just the scandalousness of her marrying Thomas Keyes secretly behind the queen's back is like quite scandalous. I'm going to give her a 7.5 because that was basically the only scandalous thing she did, but it was like a very scandalous thing. In terms of scheminess, I appreciate her scheminess. The wedding planning was perfection for a secret wedding. She saw what had happened to her sister, not having enough witnesses, so she made sure she had witnesses. She made sure she knew the priest's name. She had a feast. Like, it was all very well thought out. It just, the timing was bad vis-a-vis what Mary Queen of Scots was up to. So it was a good scheme. But then when you think about, like, in her future and how she... I don't even know how she schemed to get all of her money back and to be able to have a house and then to convince Elizabeth to take her back. Like, I feel like Mary Gray kind of a legend like her cleverness and her scheminess were dare i say even better than her older sisters which again as myself being the third of three sisters i feel like that's one of the benefits of being the youngest is you get to see what your sisters did learn from them and then become even more schemey than them i'm gonna give her i think a 7.5 as well for scheminess her significance I mean, frankly, I love her. Her significance in my heart is major, but her significance to all of this is not as much as Jane. It's not as much as Catherine because Mary Grey was never really a threat for the throne. Her actions, they're not, in the grand scheme of things, super significant. Like the tide had already turned with what Catherine Grey had done and then with what Mary Queen of Scots was up to. So I'm I'm so sorry. But still, there's some significance. Like, she was enough of a challenge to Elizabeth that she was sent to jail. So I'm going to give her a five for significance. And then the sexism bonus is where we add up to see how much living under the bullshit patriarchy of her time got in her way. But I don't think it was especially bad for her. I mean, like, okay, so when she was eight, she was engaged to be married to the guy with the pike through the head, the, like, middle-aged man. But she didn't end up having to marry him because of the Jane Grey scenario. And then she got to choose her own husband. And then she was sent to prison, but that wasn't like patriarchy based. Except for, I guess, Elizabeth's power was inherently dependent on the patriarchy. I don't know. I think I'm going to give her like she gets more than a five because of that like betrothal at age eight to the old guy. But I'm going to give her a 6.5. So let me just add all of this up. So 26.5. For Lady Mary Grey. So what what this place is her, just so you... I really need to figure out a place to put the scandalous scale so you can see these numbers and you don't just have to trust me randomly reading off of my Google document. So the lowest score thus far this season was Catherine Willoughby had 25 and Askew had 26. Lady Mary Grey, 26.5, but she's still below Catherine Parr, Frances Grey, Mary Tudor, and then her sisters Jane and Catherine are both at 29. But I feel like this is appropriate because Mary Grey's whole thing was being kind of low under the radar, not as obviously scandalous as other people and in such a way she lived longer than either of her sisters she got to enjoy more freedom than either of her sisters she got to buy all those nice dresses and run her own house and she died like yes she died of the plague but she had a couple days warning she got to write that nice will she got to live life at least partially on her own terms which i think 
is a kind of a happy ending. So that's episode eight of this season of Vulgar History. So there's going to be one more episode of this season, not ever, just of this season. This whole, you know, it's how to lose a queen in nine days. It's nine episodes. It kind of like, it kind of has to be. But if you just can't get enough of these podcasts on my Patreon, I have two bonus episodes. So if you join the Patreon financially, you can listen to the this season's two new episodes of So This Asshole, which is the many episodes I do looking at just some of the gross men. In these stories, I put the my thoughts about them into the So This Asshole mini episodes so as to not bulk up the Vulgar History podcast with talking about men too much. So there's one about Robert Dudley, and there's one about Thomas Seymour, and there's also some past ones from previous seasons as well. So if you join my Patreon, it's patreon.com slash Writer. Uh, my history essays, including the one about Lady Mary Grey, which is like continues to be very popular, and I love that. I love that people are learning about her. Is at AnnFosterWriter.com. You can find this podcast on Instagram at Vulgar History Pod, on Twitter at Vulgar History. We have a little shop to get some merch at Teespring.com slash store slash Vulgar History. Again, that's also in the show notes, but I've been putting up different designs for all of the, at least one per episode this season, as well as some other ones. So there's there's one of Lady Jane Grey that's just this really nice classical portrait of her. And then I overlaid it with the words, fuck off, I'm reading. And it's just really great. I don't know. The merch store mostly exists just to make me smile. And if it makes you smile, take a peek there. So the main book that I was listening that I used for this is the Leanna Delisle book, The Sisters Who Would Be Queen, Mary, Catherine, and Lady Grey, A Tudor Tragedy. Truly, this episode, the one, the Catherine Grey one, like I got so much information from these books, or from this book, I would totally recommend if you just, if you like this, you know, hour and whatever, dive into Lady Mary Grey, just listen to the whole book. It's, you can get the audiobook on Libro.fm, or you can read the book, just to fill in all the blanks about this, these really cool three sisters who I'm obsessed with. Yeah, and so I have a list on bookshop.org of just all the books that I've mentioned on this podcast, uh, the ones that I've used for research and ones that I just recommend for reading about cool women in history. I guess that's everything. This is another maxi sode, not quite as long as the last one, but these gray girls, they just really, there's so much to talk about them and people don't know about them. And I think I'm just excited to be able to talk about them with other people. So take care out there in this chaotic world we're living in. I'll talk to you next time, and keep your masks on and your tits out. Talmor, Sheshin Mughachi. Talmor is my home. Amir Furach Alberson. My family have worked the land for generations. My gran says the island does not belong to us, but we belong to the island. And we must be ready, for a great evil is coming, and death follows with it. Listen and subscribe to the latest season of Undertow, The Harrowing, a story glass production presented by Realm, available wherever you get your podcasts. Contained herein are the heresies of Radolf Buntwine, erstwhile monk turned traveling medical investigator. Join me as I study the secrets of the divine plagues and uncover the blasphemous truth that ours is not a loving God and we are not its favored children. The Heresies of Radolf Buntwine, wherever podcasts are available. I'm Laura Cathcart Robbins, and I'm the host and creator of Only One in the Room podcast. Every week, my co-host Scott Slaughter and I invite you to join us for an hour and lose yourself in someone's incredible Only One story. We talk to the realest of real people dealing with issues like infertility, addiction, human trafficking, and body shaming. Oh, and we want to be fair, so we talk to some celebrities too. Oscar winners, New York Times bestselling authors, supermodels, and even the most decorated U.S. Winter Olympian. Everyone is invited to share their only one story with our listeners. This podcast is for anyone who has ever felt alone in a room full of people, which is to say that this podcast is for everyone. Download Only One in the Room wherever you listen to podcasts today.